This is a Gilbriar Productions video by me, Paula Stone. Um, I'm Kathy Saucier, and uh, welcome to our farm. This is the Lion Decker farm, been in the family since 1904. And uh, Gary and I just got to retire here in 2018, but I've spent my whole life on this property. So it's uh, very sentimental and dear to me. Uh, we moved the cabin on here as a temporary living quarters. And I decided that I, of course, have to put native plants. I can't just leave it as is. Uh, and I decided to put a walkway around the cabin up against it because I learned the hard way in the city when you landscape up against your house and then they need to come paint or roof, your landscape is trampled on. So this is an access area to the cabin as well as a walk path. The landscape in the front yard is what I call my no grass lawn. It can be walked on, it could be mowed. It's all short plants. I have things that naturally occurred in here already that I've encouraged because the cows and the deer can't eat it. The horse herb, and the tube tongue are the main plants in here that were already existing. There are wild ruellias, which is not this guy, but this broadleaf plant right there. They'll be blooming probably in another month. Uh, I added four nerve daisy and blackfoot daisy phlox snake herb, that's one of Paula's favorites, uh, bluets, I'm trying to remember what else, uh, Barbara's buttons. Down in this direction, the wine cups were added, but they were just moved from elsewhere on the property. And this is the trailing wine cup that spreads along the ground. So it just mixes real well into the rest of the uh, low growing ground cover type plants. A few other additives. Uh, there's some heirloom bulbs. I have a few special non natives around the oak tree, but otherwise, everything else is native. Uh, the white prickly poppy came up on its own, and I decided it could stay there. It's a little prickly for having it next to a walk path, but that one's far enough off the, off the edge. Outside my gate, as you're walking in, the prairie verbenas were gorgeous this year. They came up everywhere. and I let them grow wherever they wanted. So we walk around them and over them. The little white flowers are closed up right now. They will open up when the sun comes out. And that's the little plains flea bane. It's perennial with kind of grayish foliage stays very low growing and just blends in really well with the tube tongue. So in our backyard is a forest of dead live oaks. Oak wilt hit us uh, quite a few years back and turned it from a forest to a uh, sea of dead tree trunks that a lot of people don't like. We decided we liked the look of the tree trunks because the view from our cabin, we look out, we see the trunks, we don't see the dead tops. So we still get that feeling that we're living in a forest. So what I decided to do with the dead trees that were actually in my backyard was to grow greenery up, up them. So all my vines are growing up the dead live oak trees. 
the first one here has a floral honeysuckle at its base and on the end is climbing prairie rose from north texas and i'm starting to train it up the branches i also have a passion vine that i'm training up the branches and it's just sprouting out so it hasn't gotten large yet there's also understory trees in the back and a cherry laurel tree in the front and oh my goodness, you're going to have to get a close up of these roses because they're covered in honeybees this morning. <laughs> Let's see if this angle. I wonder where the honeybees have been. Now I know. This landscape section in here actually started about 15 years ago, uh, implementing my uh, great-grandfather's pig pen remnants. We left the tin and the old posts and lumber and piled limbs all around it and planted a beautyberry and a turk's cap in here. After we fence this backyard in for the cabin, I was able to take all those branches away, but I left it just enough to create a, uh, a mulch on the ground and, and give it character. This was supposed to be a shade garden. Uh, it started out that way, but losing the live oaks, it's been a little on the sunny side especially in the hot uh, west afternoon sun. So it's been interesting to see how these shade tolerant plants are taking the sunlight. And they seem to be doing just fine. Uh, so I'm happy with that. Uh, these islands that I have planted back in April of 2018 were put in. I brought 85 plants down before we moved down. Plants always come before people, of course. And so I planted these islands and for fear of the deer eating everything, I had fencing around each of the planting beds. After we moved here, there we saw no evidence of deer, no droppings, no nibbling. I took away all the fences. The deer do not jump into my backyard because the fence is too crowded to the structures and the plants and they don't have a safe landing zone. So I've been able to get away with a four foot uh, wire mesh fence. When we were uh, managing these dead live oaks, we pulled down the more fragile tops of them using ropes and a pickup truck. And this one unfortunate tree got broken off near its base and went horizontal on us. And as soon as I saw that, I saw opportunity. It became my vine fence for my decorative vines, the ones that don't get big enough to uh, give you shade. The red on the left is Texas clematis, scarlet uh, clematis, uh, red clematis, those are all common names for the same thing. That is in an endemic to the hill country. First one I ever saw was out at Lost Maple State Park. To the right of the red clematis is a purple one, the purple leather flower clematis. This particular vine, uh, its seed came from 
right across the road from our property. And we have dozens, hundreds of these vines growing down at our section of the river. So I was able to get a very local seed source and cultivate it and grow it in several places in the backyard here and other places. And it is in its prime right now with all those cool flowers nodding above the plant. And I've started training it up the tree with the cross vine. The cross vine hopefully someday will give us some shade by going up and getting kind of bushy on top. But when you see these dead trees, you don't think, oh, how ugly dead trees everywhere. Instead, they're a trellis for all these gorgeous vines that are actually hard to find ways to landscape with vines. And this has worked uh, beautifully for me. I have four of the Texas clematis and two of the purple leather flower clematis in this backyard. I have two coral honeysuckles, two cross vines, a mustang grape, and the climbing prairie rose. Oh, and passion flower vine. So I've got quite a few vines going to uh, climb up the trees and make them look green. Virginia creeper is one of my favorite vines for trying to cover a tree, cover a trellis, um, create shade up above like a canopy. This one was planted in April of 2018. It has grown up the tree, up these branches, and if you can look all the way up in the top here, it's even starting to kind of dangle down and cross over to some of the, of the other dead branches. It's also about to be in bloom. It's covered in little buds. You can probably see it against the sky or up here on the, uh, on the trunk. If those flowers are pollinated and create berries, it's very pretty. The, uh, the stems to the berries are red and the berries are like a dark purple. And so they're very attractive. And then in the fall, the leaves of the Virginia creeper turn a beautiful red. And so you've got your uh, rival to the Northeastern fall colors by growing things like Virginia creeper. And I just love how easy it is to grow. And I think more people should find ways to use it. It can be used as a ground cover even. So, uh, but I'm using it as a vine, having it go upward. And uh, I've got it growing in pots in my plant corral and it has become a ground cover because it goes out of the pots and covers the ground. So I'll never have a shortage of it. <laughs> This was actually the first island that I planted and put fence around back in that April 2018. And we're under the shade of a great big cedar elm. So I put shade tolerant plants in here and I can't believe it's still blooming, but we've got red columbine flowers still blooming on this. These red columbines have been doing really good in here. I have to give them a little extra water. But, and I only have red columbine and none of the yellow because they can cross and give you a hybrid. So I've chosen to only have the red columbine. To the right of the columbine, we have the yarrow and the cedar sage. Yarrow actually grows native on the property here. And the cedar sage I brought in, I figured this land with its dry, sandy soils and the shade under the cedar elm, this would be a great place. And the cedar sage took off and totally surrounded my cedar elm tree. 
and it's usually an early spring bloomer. So I'm thrilled the rains must have uh, encouraged it to keep blooming. I've got beauty berry bush that's actually in bloom, or about to be. It's got little tiny buds on it. This particular beauty berry bush has peptabismal pink colored berries, and I bought it in Nacogdoches, Texas. Uh, which you would think with the acid soil, it wouldn't do well. It did fine in the Dallas area, but it does even better here. So uh, I've been real pleased. I've been able to keep that one going. And then another shade lover is the spider wart. This one, I believe, is Occidentalis. It's from Bar Ditches up north of Dallas and Salina area. I discovered that I have an endemic spiderwort growing down at the river, so I'm going to incorporate that one into a different landscape. And then you have weird things happen. <laughs> you plant something and it had seeds in the pot. This is an eastern red bud from North Texas. And I had a almost state record sized Eastern red bud in Carrollton and it would seed out into all my flower pots. And now I've got a tree coming up here and well, it's too sentimental to cut it down. So I'll let it figure out how to fit into the forest. So over in this little corner of my yard, I have an area I call my annual natural area and it just kind of creeps right into what I call my lawn, my walking area and I let things come up, I add seeds, I've added plants, let them seed out, come back the next year. In the front here, and every year it's different where they are, but in the front here are the cowpin daisies which we usually think of as fall bloomers but they really do kind of they come up mid-spring and bloom until it freezes. And that's probably one of the best nectar plants I have. That and the Greg's Mist Flower. Behind it, this is green thread. It is uh, Thelosperma, is what you'll hear me calling it. Thelosperma uh, filifolium. And it's actually a perennial or short-lived uh, perennial. And it's blooming its heart out. Started out with one plant and now there's a bunch in there. I love the fine foliage that kind of blends in really well with the standing cypress. They both have a really neat fine foliage to them. The standing cypress seeds thrown out they come up where they want to, and uh, it's great when I sit at my table in the morning and watch the hummingbirds coming to the standing cypress, and then in the fall, butterfly migration, this area is just, it's, the wild area seems to be the best place for everybody. You get the caterpillars, you get all of the little insects, little bees and wasps, um, really neat uh, bumblebee that we have here. And, uh, of course, the monarchs and the queens and the American ladies and the painted ladies and the crescents and the checker spots and sulfurs and on and on. <laughs> so it's nice to have a little area where you can kind of let it go wild, do what it wants. And you'll notice there's a horse mint the lemon horse mint in here, which is an annual. And I've been trying to get it going and each year I seem to have one plant. Uh, this year I have two plants. The other one came up in a place it shouldn't be and it gets to stay there because I want more horse mint. And I have one basket flower plant. It hasn't opened yet. And if I need to put my hand behind it. Um, this is basket flower. 
hasn't opened quite yet, but you can see the what looks kind of like a thistle, but it's soft. And then it will have a flower head that looks like a thistle, the purple lavender soft filaments. One of my favorites is the, uh, the prairie verbena. And uh, we have it all over the place, but this year there's no cattle on the place uh, since January. And all these plants that normally can't survive uh, because of the cattle have been spreading, including my cowpin daisies and my verbenas and my black-eyed Susans have been migrating out of the little annual flower wild area out into the pasture here. And I'm loving that the cattle aren't here and I can increase the uh, plants past my fence line. Well, this is a perennial prairie plant called bluets, maybe prairie bluets. And uh, neat little flowers have just a little hint of pink or lavender to the petals. And it grows in this cool little bouquet and looks like that all summer. And uh, I just, I wish more people would recognize it and put it in their landscapes. I can see some little tiny insects on it right now. So all these plants that you think are insignificant, they're feeding somebody. On one of our many newsletters last year, I talked about the tiny plants that people should notice. This is one of them. It's the showy Minodora. Uh, in Marshall Inquist's book, uh, he calls it red bud, which confuses people. But there's a reason, because the buds are red. And when the flower opens, it's yellow. And on the back side, you can see the remnants of that red coloring. And it stays low growing, um, can like a mat, almost like a ground cover, mixes well with the prairie fleabane and the plains fleabane and the horse herb and the tube tongue. All those mixed in together make a nice little ground cover. So traditionally this whole property was grazed by uh, deer and cattle. The cattle doing, I think, most of the uh, damage as far as the native plants. And uh, it's interesting to find out what grows on your land when all of a sudden they are fenced out. We were building our horse barn and the cattle thought that the pad that we were going to build it on was a great place to go wallow in and poop on. So immediately we put up a fence and ended up bringing it out further and putting in these cattle panels and having a nice gate put in that we can drive through. So what we found out is that these cattle panels don't just keep out the cattle. The deer are not bothering to jump into the space. And so most everything in here that either had a seed bank or had plants is being allowed to grow. And we've had many surprises. We've had fringed cocoon. We have various mallows. We have black-eyed Susans. Um, several different garas, uh, several different primrose family. Uh, it's just been a whole lot of fun. So when we moved down here in August of 2018, we brought a truckload of 584 plants in pots. That was my little nursery. It has grown over the years, it's shrunk from giving plants to sales uh, and putting them in the ground out on the property. And then I dig more stuff and now I'm up to almost 800 pots in this plant ground. Uh, I lost a lot. I lost about 200 to the freeze because the pots are so exposed. But 
when we first moved the plants in here, we put up these corral panels to keep the deer out. But it wasn't the deer we had a problem with, it was the armadillos. So then we've put up mesh on the fence at least a foot and a half high or whatever we had. It was just a grab whatever materials we had to keep those armadillos out because they were rooting under the pots, turning pots over and causing havoc. So uh, uh, everything in here is native to Texas, different parts of Texas. There's things from the hill country, of course. And then there's plants from North Texas. There's plants from West Texas. And there's probably some plants in here from East Texas. So <laughs> a little of everything. I've got trees, shrubs, vines, ground covers, perennials, annuals. Did I miss anything? Cacti, um, yuccas. And pond plants. I forgot about the pond plants. <laughs> And I'm slowly working through them and uh, uh, repotting, adding more, potting them up into bigger pots. It keeps me quite busy. Um, that is my makeshift potting bench over here. I have a fancy one up by the house, but we brought some sawhorses and plywood down and I brought my potting tray. And that's my workspace under the shade of cedars and live oak in a gumbumelia. I can be out here almost any time of the year and be comfortable. I have a break from the north wind in the winter. I get a south wind that cools me off while I'm in the shade. I've got a sprinkler on a timer to water these pots because they are a little more intense care than putting plants in the ground. So uh, anyway, I, I can't keep myself from potting up extras and trying new things. So I have a lot of stuff in here. <laughs> so when um, we put this fence around this barn area and the cattle could no longer get in here, all sorts of wildflowers popped up and native grasses that we didn't know we had. And uh, we've got down here, there's lizard tail gara. Here's a Texas fur vein. This is the little annual four nerve daisy. I think it's called linear leaf or slender leaf, something like that. There's a little primrose cut leaf primrose. The horse herb was here. Little plains flea bane was here. There's some hooded windmill grass, side oats, grama, and lots of grasses I don't like. <laughs> the black-eyed Susans and the Mexican hats, they're all in here. They come, came up on your own. None of this was seeded. This is Agara. This one is an annual. Um, you can see how tiny it is. It's called Roadside Gara in Inquist's book. And it's little bitty leaves. Not as showy as the perennial Garas, but uh, I'll take it. <laughs> um the verbena, the zexminia, that's a story. The, uh, I didn't even know we had zexminia on this property. I knew we had it on our, on our, at our camp house on our lease. And we fenced this off and all of a sudden, I see we have zexminia. So apparently the cattle kept that eaten off because where the deer can get it, it's growing fine. So it seems to be a deer resistant but now not a cow resistant plant. And so Zexmania is one of my favorite plants. It and I go way back and uh, it is such a tough plant that can be grown just about anywhere. It can take some shade. It takes the hot baking sun. It blooms all spring, summer, fall. It's got rough leaves that the grasshoppers don't like. 
but it's a host plant for the bordered patch butterfly to lay its eggs on. So if you have a Zexminia, and I wish I had one to show you like this, and you see the leaves getting skeletonized, being eaten, and there's all these little black fuzzy caterpillars, those will grow up to be uh, bordered patch butterflies. And they really do very little damage. The, the plant is not affected by that at all. So I can see a, a bee buzzing around on the flowers right now. Little crescent butterflies and the hair streaks. Those smaller butterflies love Zexminia. Behind all this wonderful wildflower area and wine cups and day flowers and everything, I put a fence around this little spot because it was a neat little grove of trees that I, I just felt like it was like a little secret haven. And I wanted to be able to go in there and sit. Of course, I go in there and I work, I don't sit. But I go in there and I enjoy the things that are growing there, such as the pearl milkweed vine and mature per, uh, persimmons, cedars and the dead live oaks and a cedar elm. And uh, I've enhanced it with some natives that to another, another place to put some plants. I, I'm always looking for places to put something. <laughs> so I've enhanced it with some understory trees, shrubs and uh, flowering plants and, and grasses. Everything you see growing down here was here. I did not add these. Uh, they just came up because the uh, large hoofed animals weren't eating them. Hello, Bumblebee. Am I in your way? <laughs> uh, the wine cups, the trailing wine cups, and the foreigner daisies, the verbena, the day flower, Mexican hats. Um, um, there's Sinoats grama in here, but it's not blooming yet. Horser, Zexminia. Yeah, Briar, I need to work on that. But there's always the, the bad you have to take with the good guys. <laughs> there's even uh, a vine over here that looks like an ivy, and that is native. It's called cow itch vine. It doesn't do anything spectacular. <laughs> it's, but it's interesting because the leaves are thick, kind of waxy, like a texture. And then our purple bindweed is further to the left. I did not put that there and I'm not sure I should leave it because it can really get invasive. But so is the briar. You just have to pick, pick your battles. And uh, you can see those heart-shaped leaves, the lavender flowers with the darker throat. It's called bindweed because it binds itself around whatever it's growing on. We're inside the little area I call my wildscape where I keep even the horses out and put in a few, this is where I've added things. But one of the really fascinating features that was here already that I was trying to preserve is how these persimmon trees and the cedar tree grew together. And they are truly uh, grown in. <laughs> and I just think it's really interesting to look at. Persimmons have such a gorgeous bark. Our sandy soil being close to the Perdinalis River allows for a lot of neat plants that exist here. Uh, one of my favorite vines is the pearl milkweed vine, and it's very fuzzy, has hairs on the leaves as well as the stems, and it gets its name pearl from the flower, reticulated what looks like a petal, and the little pearl in the very center gives it its name. And it's just a really cool, uh, cool native vine. So I'm glad to give it places where it can 
climb. And This is Texas persimmon, and this is a female plant. You can see the little persimmon fruits that are growing. They'll get twice that size, maybe three times that size when they're ripe. They will turn black. They ripen in August. And one of the interesting things about the Texas persimmon compared to the common persimmon that grows in the northern part of the state, those persimmons have to go through a frost before you can eat them. But our Texas persimmon doesn't need a frost. It ripens in August and you can eat it straight off the tree. And it looks like it's something you wouldn't want to eat because it's black, but it's really sweet. It's got big seeds in it, but it's fun to suck on the pulp. It's very tasty. This is our latest landscape project. Like I need more projects, but I have plants and I got to put them somewhere. This is the west facing hot baking part of the barn. And I needed to put plants in here that are going to need dry feet and handle the baking in the west sun. So it gave me an opportunity to grow a bunch of things. And what's going to go in here when we're finished with the adding the soil and the fencing and everything are plants like uh, the Buckley's Yucca, the Fragrant Mimosa, um, Callilophus, uh, Rock Pen Stimmon, uh, my Wright's Acacia, and there's a few others I'm, I'm blank on. But anyway, they'll all be able to tolerate the kind of uh, environment that this is. And to keep the horses from eating the landscape, we had to put up a fencing. And then there's the keep the armadillos out. So we had two things going. We didn't want to uh, create a block to be able to see the landscape that's going in there. So we used a mesh wire and just did the posts and the top rails in cedar. And these are all uh, repurposed branches from the property. And uh, some of these are coming since the, the ice storm. It provides us a whole new set of materials. And uh, we have a drainage here. So we use some old cedar logs that are part of the retaining wall for the soil that's gonna be built up inside of there. So those plant roots aren't sitting in this soggy wet soil. And right now I have a lot of things that I'm allowing to grow like the Black Eyed Susans, one of my favorites. This thing has been on this property as long as I know. And the yellow bitter weeds are really pretty. This is a uh, native and an endemic to the hill country. This is our native pipe vine that the black uh, butterfly, this pipe vine swallowtail lays its eggs on. The pipe vine has relatives in other parts of the country where it's a vine that goes 20 feet up in a tree. Ours stays low and sprawling, and usually you'll only see one leaf sticking out of the ground. It's hard to find. Right here are some eggs. Can you zoom in on those? That's the eggs of the pipe vine swallowtail butterfly. There's a teeny tiny caterpillar. There he is. There he is. Let's show the big one. It'll be easier to see. There he is. They're really cool. Sometimes they're black with the orange and sometimes they're orange with the black tubercles. You kind of have two color phases. So this is your pipe vine plant. Let's see, here is a seed pod that is developing. 
and I'm hoping to get seeds this year so I can give them to a friend of mine that propagates native plants. And let's see, really the best flower is over here on this plant, so I'll let you move back to it. I'm going to separate the flower out from the rest of the plant so you can see it and then see the really neat speckled throat that it has. It's just a really unique plant. <laughs> I love it. And we have apparently a lot more of these plants around than we ever see because we have the caterpillars and the butterflies everywhere. And we have the butterflies every month of the year. So uh, they're they're kind of our signature creature on the place. This is lizard tail gara. Here is a flower spike. You can see the little tiny flowers. There are also some interesting little insects on there. Love their antenna. I hope they show up. <laughs> Here is a flower spike that hasn't come out yet. And here's a flower spike that's gone to seed. And this plant will just keep on going all summer long. And sometimes it gets four or five feet tall. It's got these really lovely soft leaves covered in fine hairs. And is it's just got a feel like no other plant. It's a kind of a rangy looking plant, but it's got some neat things about it. If you can just stop and look at the details and appreciate it for what it is. There's a little rosette down here that I want to show you. The plant is called Silver Puff. It kind of has a flower like a dandelion, but it looks more like the seed head of a dandelion when it blooms. That's the flower. Not much to look at. That will open up probably later today and look like a dandelion head. But the neatest thing about this plant, you can identify it easily turn the leaf over and it's covered with these tiny white hairs so the underside looks silver so that's why it's called silver puff and it's in the inquest book and there's a whole bunch of them and they're all about four inches tall at the most all right this is one of our native milkweeds it's the uh, yerba de zizodes that's how I pronounce it. I'm sure there's a dozen ways to pronounce it. Um, we got a blister beetle feeding on it right here. We've got ants on it. It's got the very characteristic milkweed shaped flower with the bracts down here and the other parts all together straight out. And uh, that's my most common milkweed on the property. So I try to make sure that it doesn't get driven over or stepped on, so I mark it <laughs> with an ugly flag. But uh, that, that's a very special plant to me.